Sciences here. I'm also at ETM. But I'm also a PhD student in information at Faculty of Information under Matt Ratto in the Semaphore Lab. So of course we're interested in what the future of pervasive networks will be like, especially like smart Wi-Fi environments if you're in the city. What will it be like walking around the city and all the potential things that you may be able to interact with, especially over Wi-Fi? Uh, which is why I'm interested in sort of this, this set of tools around Wi-Fi. Um, the particular software that you see here was created by Charles, um, last name escapes me, but it's in my presentation. He's from Kingston. And um, it's pretty cool. You can basically take these uh, USB dongles that, uh, that read radio frequencies and pretty much see in real time what's happening. And I thought I'd start with a demo. Uh, this is my car outside. Hopefully I'm not unlocking it. But you can see it actually has a pretty good reach in terms of being able to um, sense data, record it. And in this particular case, the PACRF allows you to play it back. Although, of course, you'd want to do that very carefully because obviously a lot of things that you might do involving uh, looking at things that are private are illegal. <laughs> um, so anyhow, uh, in this case, it's mainly looking at the things that uh, we're experimenting with around Internet of Things. So obviously, yeah. Uh, and obviously the safety of those things. Um, but obviously it can do a lot of other things as well. So in this case, I'll just tune this, that's Q107. We're obviously very close to Q107. Um, the one that you have is, uh, this is a $10 variety from, uh, uh, that I ordered from China. And essentially it uh, decodes uh, television broadcasts in Asia and Europe and FM as well but it will not decode um, digital television over the air in Canada. However, it still has this great range of being able to pick up all kinds of interesting information. All right, so I'll just go over in my slides here, and I'll try to keep them in sync because I have these two laptops going here. <laughs> okay, so. Um, so just to review um, communications terms, there's receiving and there's transmitting. Simplex means uh, one device transmits and the other receives. So for broadcast TV, it's not interactive, usually, notwithstanding some new Netflix movies that have come out. Um, half duplex is uh, you can transmit or receive in both directions, but one at a time. So in this case, um, this particular device is a receiver only, whereas the Hack RF here is a half duplex device, which means it can either listen or it can transmit. And full duplex would be things that uh, work at the same time. So two cans of a string and telephone, ethernet. I mean, two people can talk at once on the telephone and hear them both. Um, so in terms of the history of these devices, um, around 2010, uh, everyone is trying to implement over the air digital television. And um, essentially the way it works is the ordinary spectrum. So this is kind of a graph of uh, a set of radio bands across this axis and then signal strength vertically. And essentially, um, the amount of information on, in a digital broadcast is a lot. So they stripe it across many frequencies in a kind of cluster. And that's what your digital um, transmission is. It's actually digital information sort of striped across a set of frequencies. So what that means is the hardware that has to decode that actually has to read across a particular uh, significant range. So not just like a radio tuned to a single radio station. Uh, in this case, it's actually, it can tune a very wide swath. Um, and in North America, we implemented a slightly different format, so across a six megahertz bandwidth. And uh, in 2011, the Finnish developer, Antti Palosari, uh, forgive me if I mispronounce it, who was developing a lot of the uh, Linux drivers for these hardware chips, uh, discovered there was a kind of a, a device mode. So essentially, you didn't have to implement it only in a single context. And thus, um, software-defined radio was born. And essentially what it is, it's you got your antenna, and then you've got some kind of tuner chip. In this case, that's the Ultronix E4000, so that actually is a pretty good range. And then an analog to digital converter. Um, so the analog signal that it receives gets converted to digital, and then it just goes to the computer, and the computer can do all of the uh, modulation. So what you would normally have, uh, frequency modulation, FM, amplitude modulation, AM, normally that's done by electronics hardware now can basically be done by software. And if it can be done by software, we can change it. We can do all kinds of interesting things with it. Um, and this also points to a, sp a specific uh, open source project called Open Source Mobile Communications. 
Osmocom, from which a lot of the open source software and uh, drivers and information occurs. Uh, the Osmocom website is a great fountain around all of the, the ranges that different tuner chip sets support. So uh, even though uh, there are lots of USB dongles, they're not all created equal. So for example, um, the Elonix E4000 has a much wider range than uh, this one, which is only about, well, I'll show you in a second. Um, so in terms of software, that's the one I was just showing you, Charles Cliff, who's a Canadian out of Kingston. You can look up his website, uh, tell him you like the software if you try it out. I didn't have a chance to put in all the Ubuntu machines uh, because it's hard to install on 16, but I think one or two of them have it on. Uh, the more common one is GQRX. Uh, so in this case, uh, this is a screenshot of the machine that I'm on now. And you can see I bookmarked a whole set of frequencies. So when I talk about it being able to take in a whole lot of frequencies at once, you can see it's quite a wide swath. You know, basically anything from 99 to 108, <laughs> the entire FM uh, band, unless you want to listen to Indie 88 or whatever. Um, and of course, you can uh, change the center frequency at any point to look at it. And in terms of the CPU utilization, it does obviously use a fair amount of computing power to do all that modulating. Um, and because um, you can actually modulate that width up and down the range. Um, if you have like a whole bunch of them, like say if you had 10 of these, you could probably monitor the entire FM band, for example. And, and you can also record and play these things as well, which is pretty cool. All right. Um, part is related to this really interesting project called the New Radio Companion. So essentially, you can drag and drop blocks of functionality in order to create Python code in uh, the uh, libraries that are associated with the Osmocom project. And that's what we're going to do later, is you're going to create an FM receiver, uh, hopefully if we have enough time, <laughs> uh, out of uh, using the flow graph utility. Uh, but just before I go on, a little bit more about hardware. Um, so essentially, uh, there are lots of different kinds. So the cheapest is the one that you have in front of you, uh, just because I needed a lab set. So uh, it goes from 22 megahertz to 948 megahertz. So obviously, that's pretty far. I mean, that's well beyond FM. Um, there are some interesting things out there, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, if you want to spend a little more money, uh, you can get something from New Alec. And um, what's good about there is, is instead of it being kind of this uh, chunky USB thing that you can't put any of anything else in your USB, because nothing else will fit, because it over. Uh, you can actually get one that's actually the size of a USB port. And if you were actually monitoring large swaths of the spectrum, then it would be very easy to put like 10 of them in there. And you could monitor like a really, really wide swath. Um, now, of course, what's interesting is the ones that transmit as well. And there are two kinds. Uh, one is the yardstick. So it tends to be frequencies below 1 gigahertz. So uh, just where is Wi-Fi at? Sorry? 2.4 gigahertz anomaly or 5 gigahertz. So essentially, a yardstick will not be in the range of Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. Bluetooth is 2.4 gigahertz as well. However, the Hack RF can actually listen to Bluetooth and uh, as well uh, Wi-Fi. Of course, the demodulating is quite complicated. And we put network security in these signals for a reason. It's because they're, they can be uh, recorded and analyzed very easily. Um, so in terms of command line utilities that are involved, we've got uh, RTL underscore test. So that's pretty good. It actually tells you what hardware you have running uh, at any point. And then there's uh, an FM player. So you can actually put in your signal. So that's obviously CBC radio, 99.1. E to the sixth power means a megahertz, million. Um, and then you can pipe it. So if you're probably familiar with the pipe character from working with Unix, you could pipe the input into the player and basically, from a command line, have an FM feed playing out of your laptop, which is pretty cool. <clears throat> but of course, it's more interesting if you it's visual, like in the GQFX that I showed you. Um, now, there's one difference in the slides I have here from the one I have online, which is I discovered there was an error in the flow graph tutorial. So uh, this is the fix for it. <laughs> um, so maybe just note that. If you Google the error message, you'll also find the fix because other people, well, that's how I found it. <laughs> Anyhow. Um, now, SDR is a, a growing field. There's uh, at least three research SDRs on the International Space Station. 
So you can imagine it's pretty handy to be able to um, kind of record any signal coming from the earth and then use software to analyze it later. Or maybe you can come up with some kind of new signal for um, a new service or something. Then how would you prototype it out in space? That's what these are for, is basically uh, the ability to test out um, large-scale signal communication. Um, OK, and that's me. So that's the slides. Now more for the demo. Um, so I'm just going to cycle back to the main slide on the, on the one that's online. But on the other laptop that I have in the room, uh, I'll just show you. So this is GQRX. So this is pretty much comes with all installations. And it's very easy to install from Ubuntu 18. It's just uh, apt-get install gqrx-sdr. It's in all the libraries and everything. Um, running under Mac, it's a little more idiosyncratic because, of course, you've got X11 and all of that stuff. Uh, it always says that it detects problems. That just means that I changed the, the type of uh, receiver that I have connected. So I just have to select the one that I currently am using. And, but it does recognize it. Uh, So in this case, if you happen to have the laptop in front of you booted up or whatever, and you want to plug in the SDR, uh, you could try running GQRX on it. And um, once you've selected the uh, transceiver, some of them may have bookmarks, because while I was testing, I actually put bookmarks in. So let's see, uh, if I wanted to listen to Radio 1, Or in the basement, it's not quite as clear. Q107, though, is very clear typically because uh, we're right under the uh, CN Tower practically. And what's in it? There are all kinds of really interesting filters and things you can try. So uh, you can zoom in on the frequency. You can adjust the pan adapter for the waterfall. So the waterfall is the lower display and the pan adapter is the upper display. You can adjust the averaging. So it's actually really noisy like this and the computer is actually averaging out a little bit. And detect and hold is kind of interesting because then it identifies the peaks automatically. So you can see where there's actually a signal. Anyhow, I'm just going to take the microphone off for a second, and I'm going to walk around and see how you folks are doing, and see if you can get it working. So uh, those of you online, hang fire. <laughs> Okay, so I was going to say that that is called the test. Yeah. And then it's pretty slight. And then it's pretty slight. One of the things that's pretty cool is that you take the frequency, it's actually a button. So let's say maybe you saw me when I was tuning it. So if I wanted to tune this up really quickly. Like up the dial, or up or down. So the lower part counts by ones, and the upper part, or up and down, what I mean to say. And of course, 104.1 is in the frequency, about 104.5. Hmm. That seems like it's a little bit offset from where it should be. And if I zoom in on the frequency, I can also adjust the filtering, which is pretty cool. And this is the midline frequency. Mm. Right the edge. No, not better. In some ways, the $10 one is actually gets better reception than the HackRF, because I, I haven't put in the cage, the parity cage on the inside yet. But <laughs> 
Foi bem feito aí para todos os problemas de Paris. Hmm. The other thing you might consider is uh, just try actually holding the antenna, <laughs> believe it or not. You know, like the human body, you know, when people used to stand in front of aerials. Yeah. That actually works. <laughs> the other thing as well is look at the receiver mode. So mono always works easier than uh, stereo. And uh, there's obviously AM and some other modes as well. Yeah. Let me just look at see what I have in my display here. Click my waterfall stop. Oh, there it goes. Next. Hmm. Maybe it was 350. Well, that's the thing. There's stuff all over the place, and it's really interesting. So it's just—it's just something. It really is. So it is something. Yeah. So I mean, it's perfectly legal to sort of you know listen around you, but if you actually happen to find like someone's baby monitor, you would not want to bookmark it because that's evidence of intent to eavesdrop and. Obviously, you wouldn't want to listen anyway, right? Um, apparently, in the, I read in Britain what they did was uh, people would drive around with these things, and um, they announced that a UFO had landed in a park. <laughs> so, of course, everybody with one raced over to the park to see what happened, and they had their car searched. <laughs> so, um, I guess what's odd about it is it's sort of a liminal device. It's sort of on the edge of being something that's completely legal because it is legal for security purposes, but it could be misused, like anything could be misused for illegal purposes, so. Like a drone could be misused, yeah, exactly. Let's see if we can get CIUT. Oh, that's pretty good. So definitely do some experimenting with the settings. This is definitely very cool. And you'll note that there's a record button in the corner. So if there's something that you want to record, it's like a PVR, you could write some Python software to turn the radio broadcast recorder on, stick it in a WAV file. It comes out as a WAV file, basically. So here's one. Yeah, it was just a brief one. OK, anyway. But um, and obviously with utilities like FFmpeg, which are amazing for audiovisual like uh, transformation, like the command line utilities in Unix for managing video. We use them at UFT all the time and uh, lecture broadcasting, all kinds of things. Um, essentially, you could uh, take your WAV files and make them into MP3 files. Or in the case of uh, car hacking, apparently that's how like you take the file, you record it, you transfer it into another file, and then the hack RF can play back. I wasn't able to open my car, but uh, there's lots of videos online of people being open, able to open cars by like recording and playing it back, which of course is illegal if it's not your own car. 
Why do you think you were taking over? Well, actually, there's a blog post on RTL SDR all about it. And apparently, um, they now have it that some of the um, fobs, they count forward. So the frequency is never quite the same as the last one. And the car keeps track of what order they're in, in case they get skipped. But then someone figured out a hack for that, which is uh, apparently you can broadcast a signal that blocks the fob, record the signal, so you have one in the queue, and then let through the second signal, because of course it sends it a couple of times, right, when you're pressing it down. And then if you play back the original one, it actually is part of the queue and it will work. So I haven't tried that, but <clears throat> essentially it does sort of go to show that our devices are not hugely secure. And yet on the other hand, there's so many things that we could do with this. Um, so one of the things that's really exciting is the idea of uh, cognitive radio. So of course your cell phone is set to a particular frequency or it scans for a better frequency a little bit, but in a narrow range. Wouldn't it be very cool if your cell phone actually could um, not hear, but uh, you know, receive the entire EM spectrum in your area. And then if you're interacting with a smart city, imagine all of the great things that could happen. Also bad things, but you know, if you design it deliberately and in a really cool way, uh, and in an open way, you know, so the, the uh, flaws are exposed and people can fix them. Um, so that's sort of what the future may hold for Wi-Fi is the idea of cognitive radio. The fact that frequencies won't be given to specific companies like radio stations. Instead, it will be more a case of um, scanning for a particular entity across a whole bunch of frequencies, and your device will be smart enough to do all of that. It's just the computing power presently is sort of not quite there yet, but I mean, it's like anything, you just need to wait. You can even calculate how long it will take if you can figure out how much computing power it will take. <clears throat> and then of course, the other question is, is uh, there's a lot of platformization of broadcasting. So would industry actually allow that to emerge in a smart city, or would you always be stuck with Android device, Apple device, Google Thread, whatever? So that's sort of part of it is, you know, is there an open architecture you could actually create with tools like these versus um, um, versus the system that we have now where our manufacturers basically look after our security, which is all good, but <coughs> uh, it's a trade-off, obviously. So if you guys all had a good sort of look around at SDR, would you like to get on with uh, trying to build a flow graph? Okay. So uh, the one we're going to do it from, now I'll just put the microphone back on, in case there anyone is still anyone left on. Thank you for that commercial break. We'll now, whoops, we'll now resume. All right, so the one I was going to show you is actually from Instructables. So if you just Google Instructables FM receiver, Yeah, so I'll just one. Uh, oh, right, sorry, wrong computer. Uh, it's 11 steps. So RTL Instructables. There it is. OK, so in this case, uh, steps one to four kind of just uh, talk about um, the hardware, which we've already done. So uh, you should recognize this is the yardstick one, so it can receive and transmit, but not in the Wi-Fi or Bluetooth range. So uh, you could use this to debug um, Internet of Things type devices on the low frequency, because they tend to use low frequencies that travel long distances. <coughs> um, so what is an RTL SDR? They optimistically say you can hear police radio transmissions. There was a blog post by a person in Boston who said he could actually hear all the radio traffic during the Boston Marathon thing, which is interesting, because I mean, why should people not be informed, especially if there's an emergency? Um, the other really cool thing is some people have actually made like antennas out of umbrellas, and they can pick up the satellite data transmissions of when they travel past overhead. Like an umbrella is shaped like a cone, or you can use an old satellite dish from TV. And apparently when the NOAA weather satellite passes, it transmits the picture that it's looking at down in open format. And uh, there are blog posts everywhere where you know, people pick those up. And some of them even stitch them together, like, like I know someone on the other side of the world, and they take their pictures, and I take my pictures, and then we stitch them in Photoshop, whatever. 
Again, go back to that. <coughs> uh, radio devices like car keys, well, you saw that in my demo. Um, so there's, this is the actual one, that the package that I received. That's the one that you have. Um, so very good value for money. The only thing is, is the uh, tuner uh, chip that it comes with is lower, like smaller range. And the other thing is uh, I had trouble with getting libraries to work with the latest version of Ubuntu, which is why I'm using Xenial and not uh, Bionic <coughs> on your computer there. OK, so step five, FM radio theoretical introduction. This is where we are. So essentially, first thing you need to do is to close your uh, <coughs> GQRX, because you can't have two sets of software trying to run the uh, receiver. And then you'll need to run the GNU Radio Companion. So for most of you, there'll be an icon for that, or GNU Radio, sort of an orange swirly thing. Um, some of you will have just the sh uh, short shortcut, but it won't have the icon, because in a newer installation, it's, it didn't work right. And in my case, I have to use, uh, on a Mac, I have to use uh, something to find it. So I haven't installed it properly yet. OK, so this is what it looks like. And this is where you kind of build a set of flow graphs. Flow graphs. Did everybody find this all right, this application? No radio? OK. And then maybe in the background, you've got the instructions in a browser about uh, how to build a radio. So essentially, it's a signal source, a low-pass filter, and a demodulator, and then sound output. So those are the three functions that we need to make in software. We make them in software by dragging and dropping, which is pretty cool. <clears throat> so this is kind of a lot at once. It's actually easier to just look at the end of it. <laughs> so the end of it is in final remarks. And essentially, this is the flow graph that we're building. So it's got top lock. Every Python program starts with that. Sample rate, frequency of the two things that you set. Then there's the Realtek SDR source. And essentially, we'll just drag these blocks on one at a time and configure them. Uh, did most of you find that picture? Uh, if I did that too quickly, let me just show you again. Uh, so starting from Instructables, the radio receiver one. If you browse down to step 11, so it does explain it step by step, but in some ways, it's easier to look at the whole first. Structural designers call this a, an advanced organizer, <laughs> where you see the whole picture before you do the details. So let's start with the variables. So there's a bunch of them, sample rate and frequency. So now in terms of functionality, these are all the things that you can drag and drop, and there are a lot of them. Uh, fortunately, there's a search tool. So if you just type variable, then this is the variable block of functionality. And in my case, it actually started with sample rate starting off, which is interesting. So let's see what it's set to. It's set to 2 megahertz. Initially, it's set to 32K, so I need to fix that. Now, you program the specifics of the blocks by double-clicking them. So now you see the sample rate pops open. And I can make it 2 to the 10, 10 <laughs> sorry, 2 times 10 to the 6, which is 2 million. Alternatively, you could just say 2 million. And it will still show as 2m. But uh, if you know scientific notation, it's kind of handy. 2 times 10 to the 6th. All right, now this one doesn't have a name yet. What should its name be? FREQ, frequency. So the ID of this should be called FREQ. And we shouldn't set it to the variable that's in the demo. We should set it to a local radio station. So I'm going to go with Q107. Um, but feel free to pick something else. <laughs> Am I going too fast? Is this OK? So far, so good? OK. All right, so I've got the two variables. And now we need the source. So now I'll look for RTL. SDR source, so there's only one of those. I'll drag it below. 
Now, I had this software crash a couple of times while I was practicing this afternoon, but the Ubuntu one is super stable. <laughs> so you should be fine, but I may have a problem. All right, so let's look at this. So in this case, let's see, sample rate is two, yeah, two, uh, two million frequency. Uh, frequency. In this case, we don't want to set it to a number here. We're going to use the variable. So what I'll put in, I'll basically put in FREQ, which is the variable here. And then let me just check the other settings. Uh, zero, off, off, manual, that's fine. The gain is initially set to 10. That's actually okay, it's basically the volume. So in the, in the one online, it says it should be 20, but that's like starting it out really loud. You know, you don't really need that. Okay, now you notice that it's got a blue sort of tab that if you mouse over it, allows you to connect the blocks together. So in this case, what we need next is the rational resampler. I hope it's not confusing that my Mac shows slightly differently from the Ubuntu version, but hopefully there's enough that's the same that you can, you can make the connection. So the rational resampler gets connected to the source. And let's just check the settings. Interpolation one, decimation four. All the other settings should be fine. And to connect them together, you click on one. In my case, I hold down the command key. In your case, it's probably shift, option, something or other. <laughs> Windows maybe. <laughs> Um, and that's how you connect the output of the source into the input of the resampler. Then we need a low pass filter because this modulation, remember, doesn't occur by itself in frequency, frequency modulation. So uh, low pass filter. All right, so what do we need? One, one. Sample rate two, that's right. Cutoff frequency and transition width. Now in this case, the cutoff and transition are both in variables. I'll just write the word cutoff and transition because we're gonna make those into variables in a minute. And now I'm just gonna say what I have so far just in case it crashes. Okay. Um, now they're showing red currently for an obvious reason. I haven't actually created the variables yet with those names, so. So if I drag the variable here, another variable here, because I need two of them. So this one's called cutoff. And what's its value? 100K. So you could type in 100,000 or 100 e to the third. And this one is transition and it's 1 million. Now, if I was really up in my game, I'd actually be explaining how these all work in electrical engineering. But for now, let's just uh, focus on the task of connecting them all. And this is 1 million, so 1 e to the sixth. Okay, so now you see these aren't red anymore because uh, they register to specific variables. Now these are showing red because the output isn't connected to anything. And in this case, the input isn't connected to anything. So the output of that goes to the input of that with a low pass filter. And then there's the wideband FM receive modulation set setting. So we're almost there, just three more maybe. I purposely ignored uh, the GUI text box for now, just to keep it simple. So in this case, we're receiving. If we're using the hack FR, HackRF's capabilities more, we might actually be transmitting. Like if I was transmitting my car fob, trying to get my car open. So quadrature rate is 500K. Audio decimation 10. 
So what's interesting is here they've actually put it in a variable, but you can also just type it in and it works. So it's up to you. You can either make a variable or uh, or type it in. The value of having a variable is you can actually attach a graphical control to it later to make a kind of interface. But for now, we're just doing it sort of um, as we go here. Okay, rational resampler, almost there. Interpolation 48, decimation 50. So while you're learning, I mean, it pretty much comes down to following the recipes that a lot of other people who know really know what they're doing have posted. But over time, if you experiment, you'll get a sense of um, how these modules individually work. I don't really claim to understand them as well as I should to be an instructor of it, but uh, this is a student group. <laughs> We're testing out the hardware and everything. So let's see, that's good so far. And then multiply con by constant. The constant is one. I have to admit, I don't know what the purpose of this is. Why would you multiply by one? Now you notice we're showing a little problem there, but uh, we'll get back to that in a second. And then the last thing we need is an audio sync, which is basically uh, the output of the computer. So it's like a, a block of functionality that actually addresses hardware, but through predefined Python libraries. And when this is all done and you save it, you can actually look at the whole Python code that got generated by this and then customize it. So you can actually use the blocks to create a kind of prototype and then like add a whole bunch of if loops or check the time or whatever and essentially like basically control your uh, software de um, defined radio. All right, so connecting that to the audio sync and the sample rate in this case is 48 kilohertz. OK, so then the only problem is just this one. So this is the actual one where the recipe is wrong. Remember I said you might need to fix it. And the problem is, is it doesn't actually show, but you have to change this setting to float and float instead of uh, complex, which is how it starts. And that one too, apparently. OK, so now this should actually all work. Uh, what if I can zoom in a red so you can see the whole thing? I'll just hide this for now. The other thing, of course, is um, your program has a name. And it's essentially, it's in the top block. You could give it a name like fm underscore receiver. Uh, and then when you actually look in your um, in my case, I'll set it to no GUI because I know that doesn't work on mine. But on yours, uh, it'll prop the recipe should work. Like it's got all more modules on it than mine does. <coughs> all right, so I feel like I need to check that it works actually. Come on. Okay. <laughs> if it didn't work or there are syntax errors, you'd see it in this uh, window on the lower left here. And what's also cool about the variables is you can change them here. So by putting the values in variables, you can change it here pretty easily. So it's a pretty cool way to do signal analysis and study electrical engineering, I guess a little bit, <laughs> or the hobby, the hobby of, uh, of Internet of Things. And um, the cool thing, of course, is if you look through the GitHub, there's like a billion of these. Like people all over the world have been making them since 2010 and sticking them up. So there's things for doing Bluetooth. There's things for, uh, well, so there's actually code about key fobs <laughs> and things you could do with it. Um, so uh, how would I run it? Uh, well, when you have it ready and it's working, you'll see that it will allow you to execute. But if it has a problem, you will need to view the flow graph errors by clicking the red.
So now I'll just put down the microphone and see how people are doing. I cannot figure out the key to connect them. Oh, first click this with the object and try holding down either option or alt and clicking the input of the other one. Um, you deselected that one. Uh, click again okay. and then click where you want to connect it. Oh, okay. Not control. Oh, it's not control. You're also clicking and dragging a line. <laughs> the yeah. software works a little. Oh, no, shift. Yeah. Yeah. shift. Shift? Yeah. Okay, it's shift on a button, too, folks, whereas it's command on a Mac. But it's not, it's not clicking and dragging. It's you click one and shift. Right, okay. So the, the user interface works a little bit differently than otherwise. That's good. So it's just a case of uh, checking. Yeah, that's, that's the problem that I mentioned. Where you need to change. The, so I'll just show you the setting. So if you go to the second root rational or sampler, that's uh, this one. Yeah, so it goes from being the default complex complex to float float. And then you might have to also alter the, the multiplier too. And then if you have no right arrows, it should work. Oh, wait. Do I have to save it? Yeah, it's a good idea to save. Although, like I said, in Ubuntu, this is like way stabler than a Mac that it's running under several layers of program. I'm noticing my sampling rate. I think it's because there's a conflict. So this object is the sample rate, and so is that. Oh, so you need to change the name of that one and then put in the. Yeah. I think it's not detecting my source. Hmm. Yeah, that's a little strange. Is it tell me about this? It's right here? Yep. Is that the construction? We'll find it. Um, yeah, I would su suggest you save it, exit, and reload it and see what happens. Also, check to make sure that your um, GQ at RX exit properly. Yeah. And the other thing you can do is uh, from the command line, you could do the RTL underscore. Uh, That's in my slide. Let me see. Yeah, you can run the test thing. Yeah. So the RTL test will tell you if you're um, if it's reading your thing correctly. Occasionally you have to pop it out and put it in again, but um, mostly I find the these ones are actually really stable. It's just if Ubuntu 18 isn't very good at reading it. I just see the RTL SDR source. RTL SDR source. So in this case, you just need to put in the names of the variables yeah. and make sure that the idea of this isn't the same as that, which uh, one person may not have that problem. <laughs> well, this is actually a quick problem. Um, check the rational sampler under change complex to flip flip and apply. And you need to check that one as well. So that one just goes to And then the other one should just be the first set again. So yeah. we check that one. Yeah. 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 So the first two are fine. Oh. I've been experimenting with it enough to know I should really spend more time with this, but I just thought getting it was fun. <laughs> I don't know what those words mean, so. <laughs> <laughs> this is what's um, modular called runaway for imaginative flights. 
give you enough knowledge that you're curious about. <laughs> what do you use a cutoff and transition variables for? Like, where are they in this core cut? Cutoff and transition. Oh, yes. So, in, so ordinarily, they would go hit seats as cut off there and transition there. So, if you don't click it, the numbers are. Yeah, so if you type in the word cut off and the word transition, then that means you can actually change it. Right? Yeah. Now, 107.8 is data station. I can get around. <laughs> or it's Hamilton, and that's a little ways away. Or basically. Okay. Did some things. Okay, you're doing okay? Yeah. Any luck? Um, it doesn't give me any errors and it like only sounds like music, but it's like. Okay, um, so the like, reason for that is one of your numbers isn't quite right, so the uh, demodulation isn't right. So you have to go back and check each of the numbers in each of the boxes. Okay. And just like one number off it might be enough to do that. <laughs> yeah. Because I, I first time I built it, it's added stuff like that. Really that was wrong. Yeah. Okay, so in this case this variable isn't named. So you probably want to call it F R E Q. And also set it to something that's like a reading. Well, um, so Q107, for example, is uh, 107.1 E6. Or if you have a favorite radio station, in the, in the FM is 88.1 E6. <laughs> That's a kind, of in the, uh, kind of in the West End and not a really strong transmitter, whereas Q107 is like two kilometers away and it's the entire set. <coughs> So again, the value of having the variables is, you know, you can just kind of change them here really easily. Do we change all the devices to be refillables, or do you let them actually stand for as well as they're complex? Okay, so this one's complex. This one's complex. This one doesn't have a setting, but I'll just show you. See, no setting. That's encouraging. <laughs> So that one's float, float, and this one's float. Oh, looks like I may have finally crashed it. <laughs> yeah, okay, I've crashed my copy, but I did save it. So. <laughs> okay, so you're looking at complex, complex, the first setting of each of the boxes, and then the other two are float, float. Okay, so you're looking at So it does take a minute to initialize. Like, can you see how in line there's kind of a, a box in the lower left where that shows, what, shows you what it's doing? So if there's a way to sort of uh, show that box, it might be. Yeah. Or maybe there's another, yeah, no question, you're just, you're just not sure. It might be related to these icons here. It's like one of them that will show that. I know. <laughs> so of course it's nowhere near as good as like listening to the radio over the internet. But the whole point is, you know, it's what's really around you. You can do it completely without the internet, because it's like a single system. And God forbid anything should ever happen to civilization, but these skills might be useful. <laughs> Um, one for radio station that's kind of handy. So since I crashed this anyway, I'm not sure if I can get it down here, but let me try. 
The emergency radio broadcast for Toronto is currently set to weather radio. If you don't want to wait for the radio to come around. Uh, let's see. Where's the actual receivers? Oh, that's where they are. This is what you want. So where's the nearest station to us? It would be Toronto. 162.4 megahertz. So like above the, actually, I guess, yeah, that would be above the FM band because it ends at 108. So I'm just going to kill my, kill that. And if I go back into GQRX for a second. And then the frequency is 162.4. 162.2.4. four. And the other thing that's weird about it is that it's not an ordinary FM, it's narrow FM. So that's weather radio. So it's actually an automated voice that just keeps repeating what the current weather is. And there's one everywhere in Canada. And it would probably be the emergency broadcast system if we uh, ever had an emergency. So anyway, there's like a lot of really interesting stuff right there. I can't wait to try these browsing like that like later on. But the, the, the blog post is like beautiful pictures of from the sad lake passing by over it. <coughs> so I think I learned that at 7 o'clock. Yeah, do you have any questions or? <sighs> that would be really interesting, wouldn't it? Yeah. What I find really interesting is when you're actually listening to radio stations, if you tune it into more than one, they overlap each other and hear them at the same time. Which makes for some interesting uh, counterpoint, like if you mix jazz with uh, rock and roll, for example, or pop music. Anyhow, um, yeah, so you could do some interesting artistic compositions there. But yes, yeah, so what, uh, what it comes down to is you, um, then it comes down to antenna design. So when I bought this, it came with about uh, six different dongles for different kinds of antennas representing different ranges of the spectrum. So this antenna would actually probably not work with Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. I need a different one. Like you can like buy all kinds of different antennas online, or you can make them out of things like you know probably the antenna. And obviously, if you can make a satellite antenna out of an umbrella. <laughs> or even you know it'd be interesting if people mapped out the range of objects in an urban environment that actually act as natural antennas when you touch them. <laughs> like if a bus shelter, if you hold it in a certain place, or. You know, anyhow, uh, you were talking about creative uses. So, uh, the, so the more serious thing is just like, can you come up with some kind of universal standard for objects getting to know each other in smart city? That your smartphone, if it had like a wider range of receiver. The thing is, though, what I said about platformization, I really think it will happen because the original cell phones all had FM radios. You know, they don't now. They want you to use their data services. <laughs> they don't want you to use free data services. And then, and the other thing which is interesting is the chip that's actually in here was the original iPod Nano chip. <laughs> FM radio chip is the actual idea of the real tech chip. So it's, it's the same hardware and software. It's just sort of co-opted by the open source community into all kinds of really interesting things. So uh, definitely I'd recommend the RTL SDR website for like, because the, um, this website. Yeah, so there's all about satellite stuff. <laughs> And Bitcoin, holy cow. <laughs> so like leading edge stuff. These, these people have time on their hands. They're radio enthusiasts. They're all connected together. Because that's what radio started off with. And they share stuff. Let me tell you. But of course, because it's all free and you never know who's providing it, 
So that's why I have it on a separate laptop and not, you know, the one I used to administer everyone's user ID. <laughs> Thank you for coming. And uh, by all means, reach out if you have any questions. Glad the weather one worked because when I tried it in Scarborough, it wasn't working. Must have very specific range. <laughs>